Suspense. This is the man in black, here to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. In Hollywood this evening, our star is the young American actor who, within a single year, has become one of the most provocative of Hollywood's leading men, Mr. Gene Kelly. Mr. Kelly appears tonight as a gentleman named Art Kramer, a gentleman of most uncertain scruples, engaged with other gentlemen of similar disrespectability in distinctly unlawful practices. Our suspense play by Robert L. Richards is called Thieves Fall Out. And in it, in support of our star, you will hear Hans Conried as a racetrack devotee by name Canelli, and William Johnstone as Sam Grote. And so with Thieves Fall Out and with the performance of Gene Kelly as Art Kramer, we again hope to keep you in suspense. ABC Enterprises. No, he's not in. No, I don't know where you can locate him. Yes, I'll tell him you called. ABC Enterprises, ABC Enterprises. Why does he give all these guys his phone number if he wants to keep this business so quiet? Yeah, you know. Wants to do favors for people he meets in bars, drags, how he can get things for him. You know. Sure, I know. And the next day I have to get him the brush off. He's going to brag to the wrong guy someday. Hi, Yachty. Hello. Hello, Arthur. Hiya, babe. Where you been the last couple of days? Ah, uh, ducking all the guys I owe money to. What time is Sam getting the boys together? In about a half an hour, down at the warehouse. You better start down here pretty soon. What's the difference? I won't get enough out of it to buy a round trip to Coney Island. Any calls? Yeah, Canelli called a little while ago. That punk. Another guy who wants dough I haven't got. To stall him? I tried, but he said he was coming up anyway. Oh, what'd you let him do that for? You know I don't want to see that guy. I couldn't help it. He knows the way he is. Okay, okay. Anything else? No. Arthur, if you're not going down right away, can I talk to you for a minute? What about? Oh, something. Joe, watch the switchboard for me, will you, while I talk to Arthur in the next room? What's he got that I haven't got? No cracks out of you. Please, Arthur? All right, then make it snappy. Now what? Oh, Arthur, what, what's the matter lately? You know what's been the matter, everything. Me too. Oh, don't start that again. Read it. it's no use. Look, you're a good kid, but it's no use. You didn't used to say that. All right. So now I owe nearly ten grand around this town. And there's some plenty tough monkeys. If I don't get it up pretty soon, it's going to be too bad. On top of that, I had a loaded truck and a trailer hijacked last week, and there goes my take for the month and more. And you want to know what's the matter. Oh, Arthur, honey, why don't you quit? Why don't you get out while you still can? Why don't I quit? What are you talking about? Oh, you used to have a decent business, Arthur. Sure, sure, and I didn't eat. Well, what about now? It's making a wreck of you. It's, it's dangerous. You know what's going to happen. This whole black market thing's going to crack pretty soon. And when it does, you... Ah, you're... don't be silly. Yeah? Canelli's outside to see you, Artie. That punk. All right, let him come in. What's one more? Okay. Uh, better let me talk to him alone, baby. All right, but think about I, what I said, will you? Sure. Oh, hi, Arthur. I thought I might catch you. Yeah, I'll bet. Close the door. Sure. Hey, listen, Arthur. I need that dough. Well, I haven't got it. I told you that. Uh, no, no, no. Look, I don't want there should be no trouble. There's not going to be any trouble. Well, take it easy. I didn't mean that. But I took them bets from you on my own. Now my boss is after me. If I don't get that dough by Monday, I'm going to be in trouble. Well, I haven't got it, and I won't have it for another month. Can't you get it from Sam? No, I'm into him as far as I can be now. What do you mean? Sam must have plenty sold it down in some safe deposit vault by now. It isn't in a vault. It's up at his place in Connecticut. Anyway, he won't give me any more. Connecticut, huh? I didn't know he had a place in Connecticut. Uh, near Riverside. It's a hideout, way away from everything. Oh. A trail has one, too, about five miles away. When's he go there? He's hardly ever there. Nobody's there. What do you care? You're thinking of the days when you used to climb through second-story windows? Oh, you shouldn't ought to say that, Art. I don't even know where the jump is. No, I was kidding. 
Anyway, listen, I'm I'm sorry about the dough, but you'll have to wait. Uh, Art, you don't know the spot on me. You'll get it from me when I've got it. I'm uh, leaving. Uh, Art, listen. You coming? Where are you going? Down to the warehouse to watch my share of last month's take her down the drain. <laughs> at the office. Hi, McPhail. Hi, Mo. Hi. You uh, weren't waiting just for me to hand out the chips, were you? You're right. We weren't. I just wanted you to know how it worked out. It was a good month, Art. Except for you. I know, I know. Come on, Sam. Come on. Pass around the sugar. Let's get it over with. Well, here it is. In cash. Total take was 53 grand. 17 goes to you, McPhail. I got the figures all here if you want to see. I know you wouldn't double-cross me, Sam. I wouldn't double-cross anybody. And don't forget it. You should do. Yeah. Mo, yours is six. You understand you didn't bring in as much business as McPhail. I ain't complaining. And I get 21. And part of that is paying expenses. The rest is my percentage. Don't I get anything? All right. Your cut would have been nine grand. But there was that truck and trailer. Those things cost dough, you know. To say nothing of a whole load of prime meat. You have to take it all out now? I already have. I'll give you 500 to keep going now. Oh, that's fine. 500. Listen, Sam, I need dough. You always need dough and never have none. Listen, He's you... He's right, Art. you got to get yourself straightened out. If I give you any more, it'll just go to the bookies and gambling joints like the West Side. Listen, Sam, I tell you, I gotta have it. There's guys after me. I think he's yellow, Sam. You keep your big mouth out of this. Yeah. I was a respectable businessman when you were running a lousy clip joint on Sands. Yeah, Street. yeah, and you're starved. And you're still starving. Because you haven't the guts to keep a couple of mugs from hijacking your stuff. Why, you... Cut it out now. Cut it out. There's not going to be any trouble in this organization. There's plenty for everybody. Now, listen, Art. Yeah, why don't you go up to my place in Connecticut for a few days? Take it easy. And let me talk to these guys who are looking for you. I know who they are. They don't want any more talk. Anyway, I go nuts up there in the country. Go on. Pick up my car at the station. No, thanks. Well, I'm going. I'm going out to the country and tend to my victory garden. Your victory garden? <laughs> yeah. I see you about Tuesday. <laughs> okay. Uh, hey, Mac. Yeah? Uh, wait a minute. So long, Art. Uh, so long. Say, uh, Mac, uh, I'm sorry I made any cracks. Yeah, <laughs> forget it. Uh, Mac, you uh, going up to the country? Yeah, bet your life. Going down and get on the 520 right now. Say, uh, you know, uh, I think I'll take Mac up, uh, Mac, I, uh, well, I kind of need a rest. I, I, yeah, I think... Yeah, you need something. Uh, do you mind if I ride up on the train with you? Why not? Why not? It's a public train. Oh, you know, uh, Mac, I was sorry about Say, that. Say, Artie, Artie. Yeah? Don't mind me. I talk a lot. And I don't mean it. Ah, oh, forget it, Mac. I know. Say, you want to see my victory garden? Are you kidding? No, no, I got a garden. It's a beaut, too. Want to see it? Sure. Sure I would. I, I always like gardens. Well, well, in that case, you'll have to stop off at my place on your, on your way to Sam, huh? It'll be a pleasure. Come on in, Artie. I want to put this dough in the safe, and then I'll then I'll show you around. Sure. <laughs> ah, when the war's over and I'm legitimate, I'm going to build onto it. Have a lot of lawn, gardener, real country gentleman. Uh, what's this, your office? I do a little business here once in a while. Keep my dough in the safe there until I bank it. <laughs> know anything about safes? No. Huh. It's good. It's good. Not that I don't trust you, Artie. Yeah. There she is. Put him up, Mac. What? You heard me. I'm not a movie. A stick up, huh? Why, you yellow little rat? You don't think you can pull this on me and live, do you? It's not a stick up, Mac. I just want you to do me a little favor, and I want to be sure you do it. Yeah? Yeah, get on that phone. This had better be a gag. It won't be unless you do exactly what I tell you. What? Call Reed in town. Ask her what Sam has lined up for Tuesday. Say you called me over at Sam's house just now and talked to me, but I didn't know. Come on, get going. 
Atwater 3, 5562. Listen, Art. I'm no guy to kid around with. And I don't like this. Talk. Uh, Rita, this is Mac. What's Sam got lined up for Tuesday? I just talked to Artie over at Sam's place. Yeah. Yeah, up here in the country. He said he didn't know to call you. Oh, I say. That's short. No, no, no. Never mind. Okay. All right. Now, what's the day? You never were very smart, were you, Mac? Eh? That's my alibi. You just told Rita you talked to me at Sam's place. You get it? Why, you duck! <laughs> Neatly done, Art Kramer. Virtually a perfect alibi. And $17,000 in cold cash. But there was someone else who thought he had a perfect setup, too. Canelli, the little bookie, whose former occupations were even less savory. It wasn't hard for Canelli to find where Sam's place was in Connecticut, in New York's underground of petty crime find out anything. And it wasn't hard to jimmy a window, and that often enough. Uh, ah, and then to find the money. There was a wad of money here at Sam's place somewhere. Art Kramer had said so, probably in a safe. That wouldn't be any trouble either. Not in the living room, of course. Yes, maybe this room. Uh. An office, a desk and phone. And the safe there in the wall. And just as he'd thought, old-fashioned, easy to crack. <laughs> First to drill a little hole, then the soup. There'd be a quick, neat little explosion, and the safe would fall apart in his hands. Huh? But wait, what's that? A car driving up, stopping. Who? Art Kramer had said nobody ever came up here. Mm. But it was leaving now, driving away. Probably just a mistake. No, no. Steps outside. Somebody coming in. What to do? Escape cut off. Hide. Here in the office, behind the door. Hide the bag of tools, quick. He's coming in here. Uh. Hello, operator. Now, what New York City? At water 35562. Five, yeah, that's right. Hello, Rita. Sam. Listen, Rita, get a hold of everybody. Artie, Mac, Moe, everybody you can. I've got a tip off. There's going to be a raid. Yeah, cops. Tell the boys to duck. Lay low until they hear from me. Find out where they're going to be and call me right back as soon as you contact everybody. Got it? Yeah? Oh, okay. I'll get hold of Mac myself as long as he's up here. Are they too? Well, I'm calling from my place now. I don't see him anywhere. Well, he must have changed his mind. Well, I didn't look in the garage. He came by cab. He's probably around someplace, yeah. Well, I'll wait for your call, then. Okay, Rita. Hey, make it snappy now. Hey. Canelli. What are you no, doing? Listen, Sam, I just... That's safe. Why are you... Oh, oh, oh. Sam. Here's Mr. Papa. Death. Death. Yes, hit him too hard. Murder. That's a lot different from house yeah. Murder. The phone. Somebody calling Sam. Fear, blind, unreasoning fear. Smash it. Rip it out of the wall. So whoever was on the other end could actually hear, actually see what was in this room. Murder and a murderer. Oh. Yeah. Get hold of yourself. Think, think, think. What now? The money. You have to have the money now. Make a getaway. Mexico, South America. Maybe Sam. Yes, the body. If you even touch him, to turn him over. There, the wallet. Empty. Other pocket. No, nothing. The safe, then. Finish the job quick. Then get out. Find the drill again. Hurry. Again, somebody coming. Who? Never mind. Not going to be caught this time. Can't be a murderer. Close the door. Lock it quick. Lock it. Key. Hide. Maybe whoever it is will go away. Then come back and get the money later. 
Yes. Hi, quickly. Kitchen. Get out the back window again if you have to. But wait, wait. He's not following. I wonder who it is. Have a look through the crack of the door. Careful. Yeah. Art. Art Kramer. The suitcase. They're going to stay. But wait, why not? Art wouldn't know anything. Couldn't with the office door locked. Give him a plausible story. Stay overnight. And get the money when he's asleep. A chance. But have to take it. Uh, have to have the money now. Why not tell Art he'd come looking for Sam to borrow? Then looking through the house for him. Call him. Yes, make it look natural. He can't answer now. Call him. Sam. Uh, Sam. Hello, anybody here? Hello. Who is it? Who is it yourself? I'm looking for Mr. Gross, Sam Gross. Well, oh. what are you doing here? Hello, Arthur. I was looking for Sam. I thought you didn't know where this place was. Oh, I found out. Yeah? Oh, what made you think Sam was going to be up here? Why, I heard a tip in town. There might be some trouble. I figured he might come up here to duck out. What kind of trouble? Cops, yeah? I didn't hear anything. I don't know, but... I do something. You know, I need dough the worst way. I figured Sam might let me have a little. He paid off today, didn't he? That's right. Oh, uh, did you get in? Eh? Well, if, if you did, I, I don't like to keep asking you, but I need it, Arthur. Why, uh, why, uh... Look, uh, Canelli. Huh? You know, I meant to get in touch with you about that. I wanted to talk to you this afternoon. You mean you got something? Uh, come on inside, I'll tell you. Oh, sure, sure. I, uh, got an idea. <laughs> idea came like a flash to Art Kramer. Frame Canelli for the murder of McPhail. Plan some of McPhail's money on him as evidence. And who would ever believe Canelli's word, a man with a criminal record against Art? Why, Rita would swear that McPhail himself had said Art was at Sam's place, simply denied that he'd ever seen Canelli. And Canelli would be McPhail's murderer, and Art Kramer would be safe forever. Now, uh, about that money. Yeah. Uh, As a matter of fact, I did get some. Not much on it, for uh, Even a little of help. Uh, how much do I owe you all together? Nearly 4000 huh? Well, uh, suppose I gave you two. I shouldn't give you that much, the way I'm thinking. Well, it, it ain't what I need, but it'll help. Okay, uh, here's two grand on account. Oh. You know, it uh, doesn't leave me with much. I appreciate it, I really. Say, uh, you're uh, really on a spot, huh? Yeah. How much more do you need? Oh, another four, five, anyway. Oh, oh well, uh, no, I just thought I know where you can get it if you work it right. You do? Yeah. You uh, know McPhail? Oh, I know him. Not well. Well, I do. He took in plenty this month. What good does that do me? I tell you, I know the guy. Well, he's the softest touch in the world. He'd give the shirt off his back to anybody if they told him the right story. Yeah? How come you don't put the bite on him? He doesn't like me, but anyone else. You mean, uh, I'll just ask him? Sure. You get anything you want. I'm not kidding. <laughs> if you ask for ten, even twenty, you, you'd get it if he had it. No, for Sure. He's up here in the country now, too. Right up this same back road, four and a half miles. Hey, uh, how do I recognize the place? It's a big place on the right. The only house for a mile. You can't miss it. Hey, I'd, I'd run up there if I were you. Yeah. Maybe I will, huh? Maybe I will. A break. The kind of break Canelli had prayed for. Get the money from McPhail. Yes, quicker and safer than trying to get back in that room with a dead body on the floor. Get it from McPhail and have a good head start. Art won't find Sam's body in there for at least a day or two. The door's locked and Canelli has the key. He can be on a plane with McPhail's money and be out of the country by tomorrow. A break, the perfect break. Uh... Well, thanks for the tip, Art. You sure McPhail's up there, huh? Sure, he's always there, every weekend. He's got a garden, <laughs> a victory garden. <laughs> That's a laugh. Well, I guess I better get going, huh? Yeah, look around the ground for him first. If sure. he isn't outside, just walk right in. Yeah. The door's always open. He's a simple guy, trust anybody. Well, okay. Uh, thanks, Art. Tip it. Maybe someday you can do the same for me. Yes. Yeah, maybe... One day I can. Well, so long. So long. And now, Art has a job to finish. Phone the cops. From here? No, better not. They might trace it. 
The gas station at the crossroads. Plenty of time. Connelly will be there five or ten minutes before he finds what he'll find as the cops find him. How easy he fell for it. But never mind that now. The gas station. The phone. Hello. I want the police. Uh, hurry, please. Hello, uh, Riverside Police? Uh, listen, I-, I was just driving down Nine Mile Road. I was going by the old McPhail place. You know the place I mean? Yeah, yeah, that's the one. I, I was going slow and I heard something. It sounded like someone was being killed. Yeah, yes, yeah, a murder. There were shots and somebody screaming and more shots. A man's voice. Oh, it was terrible. You better get up there right away. Oh, never mind who I am. I don't want to get in any trouble. No, but get up there. Yes, murder. Get the call, all right, sir? Yeah, thanks. ABC Enterprises. Yes, did you locate him yet? Oh, well, keep trying and call me back. Oh, I'm worried. Hey, don't worry about him. If you can't find Mo, neither can the cop. I'm not thinking about him. I'm worried about Sam and Marcy. Maybe they went out. Sam said he wasted my call. It isn't that. The phone said I've got to get in touch with him somehow. Can it wait? No, it can't. Not with the cops raiding the warehouse and arresting everyone in sight. Well, how about a telegram? No, not too slow. I hate to send anyone around to the house, but Sam will understand this time. What are you going to do? Get the telephone company to help. Hello? I want the Riverside, Connecticut traffic operator, please. Yes. You know, it's funny about that phone. It rang two or three times, and then suddenly it went dead. Oh, hello, traffic operator? Have you a phone listed under the name of Gross? Samuel Gross. Well, there's something wrong with it, and it's very important that I get in touch with Mr. Gross right away. I'm a secretary. Will you send a man up right away? Thanks. And would you tell Mr. Gross that I've been trying to reach him? Thank you. See, when Sam finds out there's something wrong with his phone, he can phone me from outside. Yeah, pretty smart girl sometimes, Rita. Yeah. Don't you believe me? I just wish I was smart enough to get some sense across to that guy, Art Kramer, once in a while. You kind of like him, don't you? Cut it out. Yeah, don't worry about Artie. He'll be all right. Yeah, I suppose. I suppose he'll be all right. Mr. Gross, I'm from the telephone company. Mr. Gross isn't here. Oh. Well, we just got word from New York that his secretary's been trying to reach him, but his phone is out of order. I was sent up to look at it. Sure, go right ahead. I'm a friend of Mr. Gross. I know he wants you to fix it. Okay. Where is it? First door to your right. Well, looks like we've got more visitors. Yeah, cops. Well, I'd better get after this phone here. Uh, I'm sorry to trouble you. I wonder if we can use your phone. Uh, it's out of order, I'm afraid. There's a man here fixing it now. What's the matter, officer? Trouble? Yeah, a little killing up the road. He didn't want to handle the phone there. Might be fingerprints on it. Uh, murder? That's right. At the old McPhail place. Caught the guy red-handed. Murder and robbery. He even found the dough on him. Yeah? Who did it? This is name is Canelli from New York. I wouldn't tell you all this except it's an open shut case. Couldn't explain what he was doing there or how he got the money or anything. Well, you'll read about it in papers tomorrow. You, uh, have him outside now? Yep. Well, we'd better be going. Hey, mister, that door you got, you got it's locked. You got a key? Why, no. Well, what's the matter? You lost the key someplace? Well, I, I, I must have. The, the room with the phone in it. Well, maybe I can help you out. I got a little gimmick here that might open it. Thanks. Yeah, we got to have things like that in this line of business, you know. Is uh, this the door? Yeah, that's it. There you are. Oh, thanks. You uh, don't need me in there for anything, do you? No, sir. Well, good night. Good night. Hey, stay officer. Yeah? You better come in here a minute. Oh, uh, wait a second, will you, Jim? Uh, sure. What's the matter? Hey, mister. You been here all day? That's right. Why? Nobody else been here all afternoon? No, sir. Oh, What's this? You find something wrong in there? You said it, mister. Put up your hand. Hey, what's the idea? Now, huh? Jim, take a look at what we got here. Yeah. 
Well, well. Cover him, Jim. Okay. Oh, what is... Hey, let me see that. Sure. Sam. No. Robbery, too. Been through his wallet and started on the safe. Just like the other guy. Let's risk him. No. No, I didn't do this, I tell you. I didn't do it, I tell you. Uh, here's the dough, all right. A roll big enough to choke a horse. Look, you guys. I tell you, I didn't do this. Yeah. Kind of interrupted you, didn't we? Come on. Look. I didn't do this, I tell you. I didn't. I didn't do this. I did I did I did I did And the story ends with a newspaper clipping. I'll read it to you. Bridgeport, Connecticut. Arthur Kramer and George Connelly were executed here today within ten minutes of each other to bring to a fitting conclusion one of the strangest series of coincidences in the criminal records of this state. Both men committed the same crime, murder and robbery, within a few miles of each other, on the same day, and at almost the same time. Both victims were operators in the New York black market. Kramer was convicted of the murder of Samuel Gross. Canelli killed Edward McPhail. Both killers were caught on the scene of the crime, were arrested by the same officers, taken together in the same police car to the same jail. Both proclaimed their innocence, yet pleaded guilty in the face of the overwhelming evidence against them. A curious factor in the case was that though both men denied knowing the other... They tried repeatedly to attack each other in the prison yard until guards were forced to keep them out of sight of each other at all times. Police have always believed there was some connection between the two crimes but have never been able to find out what it was. And so closes Thieves Fall Out, starring Gene Kelly. Tonight's tale of Suspense. Appearing with Gene Kelly, who is to be seen currently in Metro Golden Mayor's Technicolor musical Thousands Cheer, were Hans Conried as Kennelly and William Johnstone as Sam Gross. This is the man in black who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next week, same time, when our star will be Mr. Vincent Price. Mr. Price will be heard in a suspense play by E. Jack Newman, dealing with the Gestapo and called The Strange Death of Charles Umberstein. The producer and director of suspense is William Spear, who with Lud Gluskin and Lucian Malowick, conductor and composer, and Robert L. Richards, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. Don't miss suspense when this series moves to a new day and time. The day, Thursdays, beginning December the 2nd. The time, 8 p.m. Eastern War Time and 7 p.m. Central War Time. In the Mountain and Pacific Time Zones, listeners will hear suspense on Mondays, beginning December the 6th at 9 p.m. Pacific War Time. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is the man in black, here to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Heading our Hollywood cast tonight is the distinguished American actor, the star of the Broadway suspense drama, Angel Street, who has recently returned to this coast to resume his film career, Mr. Vincent Price. Tonight's suspense play, which presents Mr. Price, and which is produced and directed by William Spear, relates an episode of recent years in the unfriendly Nazi capital of Berlin. The Strange Death of Charles Umberstein by E. Jack Newman is tonight's tale of suspense. If you have been with us before, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you, stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation, and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. 
And so, with the strange death of Charles Umberstein, and with the performance of Vincent Price, we again hope to keep you in... Suspense. I was infuriated to think I had been trapped. The thought that someone had discovered my intentions maddened me to the breaking point. Nothing had slipped. Everything had run smoothly as I had planned. No evidence, not the slightest trace, nothing. And yet, I was trapped. Trapped? But why? How? Let me see. Papers in my briefcase. Train ticket. Information forwarded safely to my office. And he knew. How? 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 But he did know. I stood quietly in my room watching him. Watching him. Watching me. Waiting for me. Standing by the lamppost beneath my window. Knowing. Knowing he had trapped me. Waiting for me. I recognized him almost immediately. Captain von Heinz. Once before, I had seen him briefly in Herr Miller's office. I had been working on some corrections. Herr Miller was escorting him through the plant on an inspection tour. They stopped for a moment outside my office. I glanced up as Herr Miller gestured my way through the partially open door. Well, here it was. They were talking about me. My heart stopped. He was explaining how I had been recommended by the Führer himself, my qualification. They continued on their tour. Herr Miller ex- explained later when I went to his office. Aha, Umberstein, there you are. Herr Miller, you sent for me? Yes, Umberstein. This morning when Captain von Hein and myself passed by your office, I knew it was you. You knew it was me? Yes. Captain von Hein is head of Gestapo intelligence in this area. Uh, he was conducting a routine inspection this morning, and it was he who suggested that what? I... What? Well, since your recommendations were by the Führer himself... And yes. Your work here has been excellent. I knew you were the man when I passed by today. My work? Huh? Oh, <laughs> no, 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 of course, not that. Uh, why, you have become one of our best men. Oh, thank you, Herr Miller. No, this is it. Yes, Herr Miller. Through various posts, we are releasing more prints on munitions areas in this country uh, and other countries. Huh? <laughs> you are to be in complete charge of their release from the war. I understand, Herr Miller. As a citizen of the Reich, I am greatly honored that I have been given such an opportunity. An opportunity to show your loyalty. An honor. I will give you the combinations. You will see that no other person enters the wall. Of course, Herr Miller. Uh-huh. Uh, one moment, Umberstein. Uh, yes? I think I should tell you that a few months ago in one of the neighboring plants, the Gestapo apprehended a spy. Yes? He was working for an enemy espionage service, found in possession of certain vital documents which he had access to in his work. And uh, what did they learn from him? Oh, many things. He was reluctant to speak at first, but it's difficult to hold out indefinitely. <laughs> well, he finally gave them enough information to locate other agents who had filtered in. It was well he was detected, then. Oh, yes. Yeah. The uh, Gestapo is still on the alert for some of his co-workers still expected to arrive. Of course, they are ignorant of his confession and his fame. So, Herr Umberstein, I must warn you to take all the necessary steps against the possibility of espionage. We cannot be too careful. I shall be careful. In you, Umberstein, is exemplified the efficiency of the Third Reich. I closed my suitcase and looked down on the street. I watched him standing there. I kept asking myself, how, 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 how could he know? This Captain von Hein, how could he know? The plan was perfect, the best yet, and yet I was discovered, trapped. It was a late Saturday afternoon, and the silence of the day hung heavy in the room. Outside it was cold, very cold, but in my room it was warm, stuffy. The radiator hissed and spewed as though it were the judge of the events to come. I was almost angry at it. A radiator... 
it was still light enough that he might see me if I crossed to raise the window. He wasn't aware that I was in the room. I hadn't turned on the lights. Now he stood there, waiting for me to return. I lay down on the bed, smoking. My thoughts troubled by the one question, how? How? How had he discovered me? Safely, I had avoided all connections with anyone who might have a chance to spy on my work. There was not the least cause for suspicion. An established citizen of the right, well-recommended, pure Aryan, employed as an architect in one of the country's largest munitions plants, certainly there was no reason for him to suspect me, the Gestapo, this Captain von Hind, waiting to take me. Freulein Keller. Freulein Keller. Absurd. Oh, of course not. Not she... Could you ever trust a woman? Fräulein Keller. Did I give her any reason, any reason at all? Good morning, Fräulein. Oh, good morning. My name is Charles Umberstein, and I am to be at the munitions factory near here. I wish to take a room. Oh? One facing the outer street, Fräulein. If you can accommodate me. Oh, I think so. Oh. We have one that is on the second floor. Overlooks the street corner. Oh, fine. I'm glad. It, it looks comfortable here. Small and comfortable. Oh, yes. You will like it, I'm sure. Uh, I am the owner and manager here. Fräulein. Uh, sign here, please. Yes, of course. There you are. Oh, thank you. Otto, would you show Herr Umberstein to his room? Yes? Yes, who is it? It's I, Fräulein Keller. Oh, just a moment. Yes, Fräulein? I I have brought you some extra blankets. Oh. You may be cold. Oh, that's very thoughtful of you, Fräulein. And uh, Herr Umberstein, down the street, a little cafe. You may find nice meals and a little music, too. Oh, wonderful. I am indebted to you, Fräulein. Oh, but you are my charge. I look after my guests. It is my job. Oh, that is most kind, Fräulein. Uh, Herr Umberstein, yes? I, I also dine at a little cafe often. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Here's to you, Fräulein, oh, yes. for your wonderful hospitality. Oh, to you, Herr Umberstein. <laughs> oh, Fräulein, it's growing late. I must be off. I have a great many things to do tomorrow. Oh, and so do I. Oh, it has been a wonderful evening. Wonderful. Yes, wonderful. Here's your coat. Hi, it's growing colder now, isn't it? Oh, yes, the winter will be here soon. Too soon. Yes, but I won't be... Eh? Uh, you won't be? Oh, nothing, Fräulein, nothing. You will be here alone. Certainly, Fräulein, certainly. I was just uh, wishing. Oh, wishing? For what? Now I had done it. I would started to thinking. Perhaps she could... Oh, here for what? Oh, nothing, Fräulein, nothing important. Only the hopes of every man. They become so near sometimes. They're almost reality. So? What else could I do? I had to lead her thoughts away somehow. She took the lead. You mean a woman? Yes. Yes, Fräulein, you. Oh, but we have known each other for such a short time. Only two weeks. That's I... true, but I've been aware of you for a longer time, though I've just met you. Oh, oh Herr Umberstein, I... <sighs> Charles. Oh, Charles? <laughs> First, I was uneasy about the whole affair. Then after a while, I, I did grow rather fond of her. She was so accommodating, and we dined together each evening, and I, I played my role to the letter. Never once did she mention my work. Oh. Fräulein Keller, what are you doing in my room? Well, I was... I, Anna, I was... You've been looking through my papers. Why? I was looking for something. But what right have... What are you looking for? I was... Well, I well, was looking for a letter. For? A letter? What letter? One that you haven't got. I thought perhaps you might have it. Now, out with it. A letter from a woman. Very well, Charles, if you must know, I, I suspect you have not been here. She was actually looking for a letter from some woman. Any woman. She didn't trust me. She didn't trust her, Charles. <laughs> <laughs> No, 
No. No, it couldn't have been Fräulein Keller. Who then could it have been? I walked over to the window and looked down at the figure who so patiently kept his vigil there. Captain von Heinz. Wait. Why? There had been something wrong with the passport, but no, that was perfect, not the passport. All passengers will report to the train master for passport examination. Yeah, all in order. One you can take your luggage to Berlin. Master. Yeah, this way. Next. Um, Next. Here you are. Name? Charles Umberstein. President? Berlin. Nationality? German. Hmm. Mm-hmm. All in order. Picture luggage. All in order. Thank you, train master. You must be careful, you know. Uh, when may I catch my train for Berlin? It should be by any moment. Next. I stood there in the shadows waiting for my train. I, I examined my passport again as I had done a hundred times before. No one would have any reason to doubt anything so genuine as that. I'm passing down for Berlin. I'm passing down for Berlin. God, God, must we stand passport inspection again? Hey, yeah. The Army intelligence will accommodate you on the train. Yeah, boy. Three stops, my passport was inspected. A good test. If the passport had been suspected or investigated, it would only prove that I was Charles Umberstein. I had come by the passport through Hans. At the time, Hans was employed as an Austrian customs inspector. This gave him access to many such passports. According to Hans, there had been a person named Charles Umberstein who had suddenly disappeared in 1936. Since there had been no friends or relatives to make an inquest, well, you can see. No. No, I was Charles Umberstein. Why, I even resembled the badly scarred photograph on the identification card. From the front view, he was evidently a large man, big shoulders, large head, wore a short Prussian haircut. Yes, I certainly looked enough like the photograph. Passport was flawless. He couldn't have discovered me through that. This fun height. Something else. What else? The plans? No, 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 of course not. They couldn't have discovered that. I merely made copies and left the originals. No, 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 not the plans. Why, Hans and I... Hans. Oh, no, no, not Hans. Never. It worked so well together. Oh, no, no, not Hans. A strange, silent boy, perhaps, but surely... That night in 1936, when he gave me the passport... He was our man in Austria, but strange things happen even to the most loyal. All set, Tom. Then I will not see you again, Hans. Until? Until I arrive, eh? I will be attached to an army ordnance division in the city. You will receive additional information on the first day of each month. From you? Yes. There's a hotel not far from the factory. Here is the address. Colin Keller runs his hotel. Now, on the second floor in one corner sits a mahogany table. Yes. On it are a set of silver candlesticks. Four of them. Beneath the candlestick nearest the right. You may find your information on the first day of each month. It will be written in code? Naturally. Be very careful when you pick it up, I see. And make no effort to contact me in any other way. And can I leave anything I might learn in the same place? Is it safe? Yes. Now, remember, sooner or later we are bound to be introduced, you and I. My duties with the Ordnance Division will, of course... And near and yet so far kind of thing, eh? Yeah, very far. Once inside the city, I'm Oberleutnant Hans Neumann of Army Ordnance. And I am Herr Charles Umberstein, architect. Right. Well, time grows short. I must go. Everything checked. Your passport? Perfect. I even resembled the photograph. <laughs> the Hans doesn't think so. Yes, not bad. <laughs> very considerate of Umberstein to have looked this way. Tickets? I dare through to Berlin. I report to Franz Miller in the munitions factory, produce my credentials. He's been expecting me. I haggle a little about the salary, then I accept. At first opportunity, become acquainted with MD plans. And I will see that you are highly recommended from a reliable source. Just as a matter of curiosity, Hans, who will recommend me? Oh, you needn't worry, Herr Umberstein. It'll be good, I assure you. Then goodbye, Hans. Oberleutnant Neumann, if you please. Oberleutnant Hans Neumann. Well, then, my Herr Charles Umberstein, auf Wiedersehen, wie du siehst. <laughs> Heil Hitler. <laughs> Heil Hitler. Yes, 
everything Hans had said came about. I picked up my information each month at the little hotel. I left an occasional report for Hans. It was the only way we ever communicated. And then, Oberleutnant Hans Neumann began to appear in Franz Miller's office. And eventually, Miller introduced us. In fact, Hans was with Miller quite frequently, and they dined together regularly. Hans played his part well. But one day, something was worrying him. I will wait here for you, Miller. I'll be with you in a moment. Ah, Helmerstein. It's good to see you again. Well, Leutnant Neumann. And Miller speaks very highly of your work here. Thank you. Be very careful of this Captain Van Hein. There's something wrong. I don't know what it is. He looks at me very strangely. And there is something I recognize about the man. The eyes oh, are... Right yes, yes, yes. We were just chatting a moment. Ah. I've seen Van Hein somewhere before. Be very careful. And don't come with us in case they ask you. Well, well, then. You already? Why, yes, of course. Umberstein. Uh, would you care to join us oh. at lunch? No, no, thank you. I, I have some work to do. Oh. Always work. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, then, let's go, Hans, yeah? Yeah, certainly. Oh, by the way, will Captain Van Hein be joining us today? Oh, Von Hein sends his regret. Something is delayed. Oh, that's too bad. Von Hein, a remarkable man. No one like him in the service. No one like him. Goodbye, Leutnant. Von Hein. <laughs> a brief one. Curt and sinister. Hans was frightened. He would never have taken the chance to speak to me if he had not been frightened. Something that he recognized about von Hein. Saturday was the first of the month, and there was no information at the hotel. Hans didn't appear again to lunch with Herr Müller. Something was wrong. Something had happened to Hans. Today, I found out. Uh, we will enjoy ourselves today, eh, Umberstein? Yes, they should lunch together more often, you and I. I like good company when I eat. Good food, good company, good digestion, <laughs> Heather. <laughs> and this is a wonderful restaurant that we are going to. You know, they serve Norwegian smoked salmon. That is exquisite. And, and, and cheap, too. <laughs> Nothing like these new foods we are getting from Norway. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard of Norwegian salmon. Uh, and this is the best. <laughs> you and Oberleutnant at Neumann dine here often, don't Hans you? Hans Neumann. Uh, yes. yeah, we came here often, yes. Yeah. Hans Neumann will not come here for a long, long time again, I'm afraid. I, I don't understand. Uh, no, you don't. You remember Captain von Hein? Oh, oh, yes, the Gestapo man who was inspecting our factory a few weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah, most efficient man. He has apparently been observing Hans Neumann for some time. Oh. Well, Leutnant Neumann is being detained by Captain von Hein, no? Was he... He was a spy... Hi. Uh, how do you know? Von Hein arrests only spies. And von Hein never makes a mistake. The man is incredible. Oh, was there something suspicious about Hans? There's something suspicious about everyone to von Hein. He himself asked me to cultivate Oberleutnant Neumann so that he could better observe his actions. Yes, I, I noticed that you two lunch together very often. Well, we lunch together at this very same restaurant you and I are going to now. It made it easy for von Hein. Easy? Well, to study the man in leisure. Von Hein always wants to be certain of his quarrel. And uh, where is Hans now? Who knows? Who knows what happens when Captain von Hein takes a man? Don't you admire such efficiency, Umberstein? Well... Of course. Yeah, well, the captain did indicate that there were others to be rounded up, too. Well, here we are. Oh, look, look, you see them in the window? Norwegian salmon. Oh, they are beautiful, so red, so delicious. Are you hungry, Umberstein? What? Oh, yes, yes. Oh, they, they do look delicious. <laughs> Von Hein. I looked dead him out of the window again. I could see his breath now. It was growing very cold. He was well dressed in a neatly tailored overcoat and dark hat. It was too dark to tell the exact color. The only thing I was sure of were the hands and the gloves on the hand. Heavy, thick, powerfully mounted prongs encased in a gray, tightly fitting material. Style, lines running across the back. I noticed when he lifted them to light a cigarette. What beautiful weapons. His back was to me. I 
I couldn't help but admire the fine breadth of his shoulders and the thick, closely barbered neck. He stood quietly by the lamppost, smoking, watching his breath and the smoke battle for existence in the icy air. Once when he turned to look up at my window, the single eyeglass he wore caught the reflection of the light. I wondered how much he weighed. Carefully, I retraced each step over again in my mind. I couldn't find the flaw that made me a marked man. The absurdly easy way I had gone through Miller's office carrying an innocent-looking bundle of blueprints. Then to the vault, super, super, super copies. No one could suspect what I had done. No one had any reason. Why? Why, then, was I trapped? <laughs> He was after me, waiting down there. I wondered why he didn't come up and wait in my room. Surely he didn't know I was in the room. Perhaps he had searched my room one day while I was out. But what could he find? Nothing, absolutely nothing. A passport proving I was Charles Umberstein. A monogrammed suitcase bearing the initial C.U. A few letters and old papers. Nothing, nothing at all. I had never talked. I had never known anyone else in service except Hans. Hans Miller was too stupid to suspect anything. Fräulein Keller? No. The passport? Perfect. Only one other way. Only one other way could he possibly know. For an instant, a possible answer flashed through my brain. For a full five minutes, I watched him, watched him very discerningly. Could it be? Could it possibly be? The stillness of the street below was broken from time to time by the blare of an occasional horn and the rattle of armored cars carrying soldiers to different parts of the city. Turning from the window, I groped about in the darkness of my room, searching for the automatic I had concealed in the slit compartment of my traveling bag. When I found it, I tested the chamber. It was loaded. I jammed it in my coat pocket, and putting on my hat, I stood there by the window, watching him. He seemed very ominous, very assured, waiting for me. He must have been getting anxious with his long vigil. I watched him signal to an accomplice across the street, walking back and forth under the streetlight. I noticed something familiar. Very familiar. A bolt from off the bed. Tied to a piece of cord attached to the light switch. Ah, near the radiator pipe, room enough to pass it through. The weighted end dragging the string to the lobby below. I picked up my suitcase and stepped out of the door. The hall was dark and quiet. I walked downstairs. The lobby was empty, deserted. At the bottom of the stairs, I placed the suitcase by the door and I crossed to the desk. Hastily, I jammed a few bills in an envelope and addressed it to Fräulein Keller. Now, as I picked up my suitcase... I could see him very plainly on the corner. He was only a few feet from the entrance. The cord with its weighted end had fallen just short of the door. I stood there quietly. He looked up at my room. I pulled the cord. He was startled when the light went on upstairs, searching the window for a view of the occupant. I walked to the door. As I opened it, he looked at me, looked my way gazed at me, point blank. Seemed surprised. Then assuring himself, he took a step toward me. Herr Umberstein. Herr Umberstein. Oh, you are... You are Charles Umberstein? Why, yes, I... Uh... Charles Umberstein, who entered Germany in 1936 from Austria? Here's my passport. Your passport, yes. I have always wanted to meet you, Charles Umberstein. I have always wanted to meet you face to face. You know who I am? Why, yes, you are. <laughs> I wonder. You know the others I have had my men pick up. But you, I wanted to attend to personally. It's because you are Charles Unterstein. Now we will uh, just... I'm sorry, oh. my friend. <laughs> down hard on the curb. Looked up at me, mumbled strangely, then fell over with his head in the gutter. His hat fell off, and I saw that his hair was closely cropped. There were other... 
people on the streets. I ran till I was out of breath. The next day, I picked up a Berlin paper on the railroad station. On the second page, I read the headline, Gestapo official murdered. Saturday, January 25th, Captain Charles von Hein, high-ranking official of the Gestapo Intelligence Service, was instantly killed last night by the bullets of an unknown assailant whom he was attempting to arrest on charges of espionage. Captain von Hein had been connected with the Gestapo since 1936. Prior to his affiliation with the Gestapo Intelligence, he had been known by his real name, Charles Umberstein. His entry into such dangerous work made necessary a complete retirement from all public life. The Reich will long honor the memory of Charles Umberstein. I wired flowers from Geneva with a card marked Sympathy, signed C.U. And so closes the strange death of Charles Umberstein by E. Jack Newman, starring Vincent Price. Tonight's tale of suspense. Vincent Price will soon be seen in the 20th Century Fox production, Song of Bernadette. The producer and director of suspense is William Spear. Music was composed by Lucian Malowick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. This is the man in black who would like to draw your attention to the new day in time for suspense beginning next week when Cary Grant will be our star. Beginning next week, listeners in the Eastern and Central time zones will hear suspense on Thursdays at 8 p.m. Eastern wartime and 7 p.m. Central wartime. Listeners in the Mountain and Pacific time zones will be brought their next story of suspense on Monday, December the 6th, and each Monday thereafter at 9 p.m. Pacific wartime. Don't forget suspense on Thursdays, beginning December the 2nd, if you live in Eastern and Central time zones, and Mondays, beginning December the 6th, for listeners in the Mountain and Pacific time zones, with Cary Grant, our opening guest star. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salud. Your health, senor. The world toasts Roma, and Roma toasts the world. The wine for your table is Roma. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the man in black, here for Roma Wines to introduce this weekly half hour of Suspense. Tonight in Hollywood, we are honored and happy to have with us one of the entertainment world's most distinguished gentlemen, Mr. Cary Grant. The suspense play which stars Cary Grant and which is produced and directed by William Spear is the exciting and tense bestseller by Cornell Woolrich called The Black Curtain. Suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series, Roma brings you tales calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so, with the Black Curtain and with the performance of Cary Grant, we again hope to keep you in... Suspense! It began... Or rather, life began again for me, I guess you'd say, that day, on that street. My head was pounding terribly. I could hear all the noise and the people milling around. Everything was a jumble at first. All right. Get angry there now. Let the doc 
Patrol. I see what happened, Mr. Policeman. He was running. Boy, he really gave himself a clunk on a beat. All right, son. Now get back there. Everybody back. Oh, oh my head. head. His wallet fell out of his pocket, and a big boy grabbed it and ran away. He All right, up. now back, everybody. Let the doctor through. Get him out here. I'm okay. No, never mind, Doc. I'm okay. Seems to be not much the matter with you, sir. No, I'm all right. Yes, I can talk to him now, Doc. I'll go ahead, officer. Just a bad bump on the head, I think. That's right. We can walk all right, can't you? Yeah, I think so. Ah, sure. Here, now let me brush you off. Huh? Thanks, thanks. Well, I'll be fine. Hey. hey, wait a minute. What am I doing with an overcoat? All on? right now, mister. Just so they got it on the blotter. What's your name? Where do you live? Uh, Townsend. Frank Townsend. 820 Rutherford Street. I want a cigarette. You're still shaking. No, no, thanks. I don't smoke. Well, we're getting back then. Drop in at the receiving hospital if you want us to check you off. Right? Yeah, I will. Hey, here's your hat, mister. I found it. Oh, thanks, That's kid. all. Now, come on. Move along. Guy's all right. Come on. Oh, well, thanks. I'm sorry about the fellow that got your wallet. Anyway, here's your cigar case, Mr. Townsend. Guy found it right alongside of you. Hey. Well, wait a minute. This isn't my hat. D.N. Those aren't my initials, D.N. Sure, that's your hat. I seen it roll off you when you went down. Try it on. You see? It fits. Looks good. Yeah. But what am I doing with a cigar case? D.N. Same initials as the hat. Uh, don't you even know your own hat, mister? Uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm trying to think. Where is this? What? This street. You're on Tillery Street. Tillery Street? What am I doing on Tillery Street? <laughs> He's lost. All right now, sir. My suggestion is that you go on home and go lie down. It's cold and starting to snow. No, no, please. Wait a minute. Don't leave me. Tell me. What happened? Why, you slipped on this icy sidewalk. Fell down and hit your head good and hard on the curb. You're out for about 20 minutes wait, and then wait, you... Wait. Ice on a sidewalk? Well, look at it. That street cleaning department ought to clear away the snow what? there to... Snow and ice? Sure, why? Snow? In July? July? <laughs> it's December. December 1943. 1943? Uh, you better go on home, son. Good night. 1943. December 1943. The last I remember was July 1940. Three years just gone. Amnesia. A black curtain comes down over your mind. That black curtain had been over mine for three years. Where had I been? Who had I been? I hadn't been Frank Townsend. I'd been someone else. D.N. Someone whose initials were D.N. I walked along Tillery Street thinking about it those three years. I could have been married. I could have been a thief. I could have... Something made me turn around on the street for a moment. That was when I first saw him. Gray eyes. He'd been talking to the cop who took my name. He looked up as I did. And then he started to walk rapidly in my direction. I backed away instinctively. Something about him spelled trouble. He called to me as he hey, came forward. Hey, you stop! Townsend! Townsend! Instinctively, I knew I should run and get away from him. Hey! No. I looked back as I rounded the corner. He had a gun in his hand. He raised it. Then I turned and ran from the light. <laughs> What lay behind that black curtain which separated Townsend from his past? With this remarkable story, and with Hollywood's distinguished Cary Grant as our star, the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, tonight assumes the sponsorship of Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. This is the dinner hour at an exclusive yacht club in Latin America. And we discreetly eavesdrop on that gentleman and his lady there at the table. This has been a lovely dinner, Ramon. And only you would have thought to have such a delicious wine as the finale. It was so perfect. Is it truly a wine from California in North America? Yes, see? This is the noted Roma port of California in the United States. We were fortunate to have it tonight, for now, in time of war, on the occasional ship can bring us the Roma wine. I knew that you would... Fortunate? Yes. For Roma wines please the exacting tastes of wine lovers in many countries. And we in the United States are most fortunate of all. 
where we can enjoy any of those delicious wines from the famous Roma wineries located in choice wine districts throughout California at prices unbelievably small for wines of such distinguished character. Because we do not have to pay heavy shipping costs and duty, here at home in America, Roma wines cost only a few cents a glass. What's more, you will find Roma California wines just around the corner at your favorite dealers. Right there, waiting for you now, the types of Roma wines you most enjoy. So if you haven't yet discovered the delight of Roma wine regularly with meals or when entertaining friends, make your first purchases of Roma tomorrow. R-O-M-A, Roma, America's largest selling wine. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our soundstage Mr. Kerry Grant and the Black Curtain, a story well calculated to keep you in suspense. Why was he following me with a gun? What did Gray Eyes want with me? I must have done something. I beat it down the subway and hid. I had to think it all out carefully. I knew I was on the spot for something. Gray eyes meant business. What could it be? Who had I been? During those last three years with that black curtain in front of them. Well, maybe I'd been a gangster. And he was one of a mob that wanted to rub me out. I didn't know. No identification, my wallet stolen. Nothing in my pockets that would help. Just D.N. in the hat. And D.N. on the cigar case. D.N. My head was aching with worry. My stomach had panic in it. I had to find out who I'd been, what I'd done. But how? Where? Tillery Street. That's where I'd been when I woke up. Tillery Street. Well, maybe Gray Eyes would go back there, too, looking for me. But I had to take that chance. Tillery Street. Oh, good evening, Pop. Oh, oh, hello there. Couldn't see you under that hat at first. Oh, you, you know me? Sure. What can I get you, son? Oh, well, uh, you got an evening paper I could look at? Nope. Sorry, never read them. Too much trouble in the world these days, anyhow. Yeah. See, how you been? You haven't been around two or three weeks. Oh, well, I've been kind of busy. Uh, look, Pop. Yeah? I made a bet with a guy that even though you see so many customers, you'd walk right up and give me my full name. Oh, well, I'm sorry. I don't know it. I don't think I ever heard your name. Oh. But I know your girl. My girl? Uh-huh. You do, huh? Yeah. Well, now, maybe I can still win my bet if you'll give me her name. Gee, I... I've heard you mention it. I... I'd know it if I heard it. You are? Well, uh, see if I can steal you a little. Now, is it Mary? No. Nope. Uh, Alice? Lillian? Ah, uh, Margaret. Huh? No. Wait a minute. Wait. I know. Ruth. That's it, Ruth. Ruth? Yeah. Well, sure, you got it. Now, now, what's Ruth's last name? Gee, I don't know her... Le- I know where she lives, though. You do? Yeah, right across the street, the Tillery Apartments. Well, that's right. Ah, uh-uh, but now, now, what apartment? What's the number of Ruth's apartment? Mm, 3C. Apartment 3C. <laughs> say, that's pretty good if I do say so. I was only there once, remember? The night I brought the sandwiches yeah, over. Yeah. I... Well, uh, thanks. Uh, will you win your bet, mister? Huh? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, I think I will. Uh, what's your name so I'll know it next time? Oh, I'll tell you tomorrow. I hope. So long. So long, Pop. Thank you. I'll be... What's the matter? Nothing. Nothing. I... Just tying my shoe. <laughs> I'd just been going to walk out when I saw him standing across the street, gray eyes again. I ducked down behind the store window and watched him. He looked over in my direction and then up and down the street. Oh, then he lit a cigarette and stole down the corner. The minute he disappeared, I yanked the door open, dashed out, ran across the Tillery apartments and went in. Who is it? Ruth? Yes? It's me. Danny, where have you been? Get in here. Oh, darling, it's really you. I thought you... Hello, Ruth. 
Oh, Danny, why did you come here? He's been around here twice today. He may be in the neighborhood right now, for all you know. Who? Oh, well, Fiery, of course. Uh, I think he got gray eyes. What? Yeah. Did you ever see a detective that didn't? Oh, I see. Sure, sure. Danny, what's the matter with you? You're acting so strangely. Well, I... I just want to look at you. You seem so different, so far away. You haven't kissed me. Well, that's easy to fix. Oh, darling, where have you been for three weeks? All around. Miss me? You know I did. Oh, Danny, do you suppose... Do you think we could get away tonight? I've got $3,000 saved up. We could go to Mexico or South America. We could get married. Mr. and Mrs. Daniel Neering, tour of the world. Daniel Neering? Oh, yeah, and wife. Sounds plenty good to me. Oh, you'll never know how good. We'll get out of here tonight. I'll call up and tell them I'm quitting my job. I say I'm sick. All my stuff's here. Nothing's out there but a couple of uniforms. <laughs> I'll make Alma and Franklin a present of those. Uh, Alma and Franklin? Well, don't you bother your pretty head about those two charmers. Maybe they weren't glad when it happened. A couple of vultures. Bye-bye to them. Oh, with you back, Danny. Just think with my three thousand we could... <laughs> Do you think you ought to quit your job? Absolutely, I think so. <laughs> I was never cut out to be a nurse anyway. <laughs> I guess you weren't. Any more than uh, I was cut out... Any more than you were meant to be a secretary. Ah, that's right. <laughs> well, I never wanted to be a secretary. Just drifted into it, I guess. Kind of got on my nerves, especially toward the end. You know, the, uh, the boss was no sense to work for. He certainly wasn't. He was a rat. Oh, the whole Dickley bunch are mean, rotten, the whole family. Yeah, that's right. All except the old man. Uh, oh, yeah, the old man. I, I, I sort of liked him, didn't I? And he loves you, Danny. I think he wished you'd been his son. Poor old man. He's the only reason I've stuck around out there this long. How are things out there? Oh, they've been questioning all of us. It's laid off lately, though, since you... Oh, Danny, don't let's talk anymore about it. You're back. That's the main thing. I just want to forget New Jericho and the whole... New Jericho, huh? Yes. Oh, Dan. Dan, if only it hadn't happened. What hadn't? You know what? Oh, Danny, what's going to become of you and me? I wish I knew. Danny, get away from that window. Leave that shade down. Oh, he's down there. Who? Gray eyes. He's standing from the hydrant. He's coming in here, in the building. Oh, did he see you? Ruth. Will you help me? What are you going to do? I'm going to give myself up. No, no, well, you... Well, it's better than getting shot at. What can they do to me? You crazy fool, they can send you to the chair. The chair? Well, what do you think happens to a man when he's guilty of murder? Murder? Ruth, listen to me. I'm not a murderer. If the whole world says I committed murder, I say I didn't. The me that's in me says I didn't. I never said you were, Danny. I always said you didn't do it. Oh, you hadn't run away. So that's it. All right, Mary. Open up. Why did you come here, Danny? Why? Wait. we got to get out of here. How about the fire escape shaft? Dumb waiter. Dumb waiter. Here. All right, get in. I'll stand on top and work the ropes. I don't think it can hold a boat. It's got to. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Danny. Danny, what will we do? We're going back there to New Jericho. New Jericho? No, no, please. For me. I've got to. I've got to find out. We're going together. No. no, Danny, no. I've got the money. We can get out of here and we... Stop it. Danny, ouch. My arm. You're hurting me. Well, from here on in, we're sticking together. You're going to take me back there. Back where it happened. All right, darling. Crazy, but I'll go wherever you go. I can't lose you again. <laughs> On the train, Ruth and I said very little to each other. While I hid in the telephone booth at the Pennsylvania station, she bought us a couple of cheap overcoats. I sat hunched up in mine, thinking, thinking. Ruth had brought along the newspaper clippings. I looked at what they said for the 20th time, trying to see if there was anything there that would help me. Dietrich Slayer's salt, it said. Secretary wanted in brutal slaying at suburban estate. Police are pressing the search for Daniel Nearing, secretary and the employee of the late John Dietrich, 58, member of a well-known local family who was shot and killed in the drawing room of his new Jericho estate on the morning of November the 7th. Nearing disappeared November the 7th, on the morning of which date he is known to have had a bitter quarrel with the disease. 
This last was attested to at the inquest by Alma and Franklin Dietrich, widow and brother of the murdered man. Well, I had all the facts now. <laughs> Wanted for murder. And yet everything that was in me told me that no matter who I'd been, however many memories I'd lost, that I was no killer. That I couldn't have. Good day, Good day, I had to get into that Dietrich house and stand again in the room in which it had all happened. Maybe something would come back to me. Maybe there would be... Franklin just left. I drove down to the village. Did they say anything about you being out here on your day off? Yeah. Alma said something, but I said I had nothing to do in town. He came out to write some letters. Let's go then. Oh, Danny, I'm scared. Please, let's not no, stay no, out you here. You said you loved me. I do, Danny, I do. That's why I'm scared. They're only going to the village. They'll be back in half an hour at the most. Come on, open the door, Ruth. Hurry. I've got to see the inside, that room, the place where it happened. Wrong, Danny. I'm telling you, you're wrong. You're fine. Now open the door, Ruth. Quickly. All right. Now let's have a look at that room. Please, Danny, please don't. Don't talk about it. So this is where I'm supposed to have murdered John Dietrich, huh? Danny, please. Where was it? Show me exactly where it was, Ruth. I've got to know. It was there. Right there. He was standing by the grandfather's clock when... Oh, are you going crazy, Danny? If they get you, you'll hang. By the clock. You still believe in me, don't you, Ruth? I believe you, Danny, but I'm scared. I love you. Ruth, wait a minute. What's that? Listen. Don't the old man. He's sleeping in that room off there. Don't go in there, Danny. You'll wake him. I want to see him. No. No, don't, Danny. He can't help you. You know he's paralyzed and he can't talk. Turn on the light. I want to see him. You woke him. It's me, Mr. Dietrich. Yes. Ruth. Uh, this is Danny. You remember Danny, don't you? Hello, Mr. Dietrich. See how his eyes are shining. Yeah. Uh, was he here when it happened? You know that, Danny. Why do you ask such funny questions? He's been in bed here for five years. That mirror. On the wall there. The clock. Look. You can see the grandfather's clock in the other room. What are you getting at, Danny? He could see it. The old man could see the murder through the mirror. Oh, if only he could talk. He can't talk. You scare me, Danny. He saw the man who killed John Dietrich. Look, look. He understands what I'm saying. He's blinking his eyes. Oh, stop torturing him, Danny. Can't you see what you're doing? He's trying to say something. Look. Look. His eyes are blinking. He's going to help me. Go outside and watch, Ruth. Go on. Now watch out at the entrance way. Be careful, Danny. Please, they'll be back any minute. All right, leave me alone with him. Now call if I hear them coming. Look now, Mr. Dietrich. Don't be afraid. I'm going to ask you a question, and you're going to answer me. Are you trying to tell me something about the murder? Now, blink your eyes. Blink twice if you are. And that's it. Once. Twice. That's good. Did you see it happen? Here, in your mirror. Blink once if the answer is no. Twice if the answer is yes. Once. Twice. You did, huh? You saw it. Now then, is the murderer in this house? Danny, Danny, they're coming. Frank and Alma, get out of here, hide. Run, Danny, run. Is the murderer in this house? Blink once for no, twice for yes. Yes, in this house. Danny, Danny, they're coming. Wait, wait, I've almost got it. Now, Mr. Dietrich, was it me? Once for no, twice for yes. Was it me? Get out of here, Danny, into the big room behind the curtain. I'll talk to you. All right, all right. Thanks, Mr. Dietrich. I'll be back. Ruth? Ruth, is that you in Father's room? Yes. Are you here alone? Oh, yes. Why? Well, we thought we heard voices. What are you so jittery about, Ruth? I, I'm just tired, that's all. May I go to bed now? Father's still awake, Ruth. He'll go to sleep, all right. I'm going upstairs, Mrs. Dietrich, now. Good night, Ruth. And uh, take your flashlight with you. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. It was dark on the road tonight. Good night, Ruth. Good night. She's brought him back here with her. Him, I think. Who? Dan? 
Oh, Franklin. Take it easy. If he's here, we'll get him. After the evidence we gave against him at the hearing, I... Oh, I'm frightened. Let's get out of here fast. I'll go to the village for the police. Call the police. No, I'll do it. Hello? Hello? It's too late. It's dead. The wire's cut. Come on, we'll both drive to the village. Eh? But he may be waiting for us out by the car. Uh-uh. Oh. What? Yeah. What are you doing there, Franklin? I think I just might need my gun. Come along. The moment they left the house, I made for the old man's room. I called for Ruth, but she was gone. Maybe Franklin and Elmer had caught her after she cut the telephone wire, but I couldn't wait. My life was hanging on minutes now. I shot the flashlight on the old man's face. Now, Mr. Dietrich, you're helping me fine. You know I'm trying to save my life, don't you? Now, the murderer. Was it me? Was it me who did it? Me, Danny Nearing. Blink once for no. Once. Once. Oh, you're sure. You're sure it wasn't me. Oh, you're smiling, Mr. Dietrich. Smiling. Now, it was somebody in this house. Then who was it? Oh, can't you make a sound? Help me, you've got to. Was it Elma? Twice for yes, once for no. Once. Not Elma. All right, then. Was it Franklin? Up with the hands, Mary. Up or you'll never go to trial. Franklin. Look, you've got to listen. You've got to. Shut up and drop that flashlight. Trying to kill the old man, too, huh? The murderer returns to the scene of his crime, eh? You know I didn't kill him. Well, you tell that to the police. Alma will have me in a couple of minutes. Where's your girlfriend, Ruth? She's not here. I don't know where she went. Never mind. They'll find her. You're a dead duck, Neary. You killed my brother and beat it. What'd you get out of it? That's all that puzzled us. You killed your brother, and now you're going to kill me. Oh, you've gone nuts, too. Why should I kill my own brother, you idiot? To get his share of the estate and his wife, Alma, amongst other things. But you can't stop with killing me. Someone else knows the truth. The old man saw it in the mirror. Huh? You'll have to kill your own father, too. The old man saw it? How, how do you know? He told me. Oh, you're lying. He can't talk. He can't even move. He can hear. And he can blink his eyes. Come over here and look. Now, look here. I don't... <laughs> Rolf! He'll be all right. I heard him. He was going to kill you. Here's the gun, Danny. Take it. Oh, Rolf, you shouldn't have. In another minute, I... I'm not sure it was, Franklin. Oh, Danny, please, let's run for it. You'll be here in a second. It's your last chance. I'll swear you did it. Not if I can be with the old man another half minute. Mr. Dietrich. Mr. Dietrich. It's Danny again. No, Danny, don't. Don't. What? Tell me, Mr. Dietrich. Was it Franklin? Did Franklin kill your son, John? Think once if he did. He's afraid. Well, why are you afraid? Oh. Oh, it's this gun. Here. Take the gun, Ruth. You take it. He's afraid. I'm not going to hurt you, Mr. Dietrich. Well, what's the matter? Why don't you answer me? Who killed John Dietrich? It wasn't me. It wasn't Elmer. It wasn't Franklin. But someone in the house. Was it? Ruth! Ruth! You! I told you. I told you not to come. Oh, I love you, Danny. I wanted you. I wouldn't have let them get you. Why? Why, Ruth? Why did you kill him? He was always after me. He wouldn't leave me alone. I hated him. Then that night he came at me, threatened me, said he'd kill me. If he couldn't have me, nobody could. He had a gun, and I got it away from him. It... He hit the clock. He leaned against it. I thought he'd never fall down and die. It was the day you ran away, and I was crazy. They thought it was you. They started looking. I love you, Danny. I still love you. I begged you not to come back here. Ruth! Put down that gun, Ruth. No. Stand back, Danny. Stay over there. I just want to look at you. I was hoping we could get away together. But you've been through enough, Danny. And all because of me. Now you're clear, Danny. And this is going to clear me. Darling. Oh, Ruth. Ruth! Well, I 
guess that's about all there is to tell. I tried to put it all behind me. To resume my life where I left off over three years ago. <laughs> Sometimes when it gets toward evening, I go and walk along Tillery Street. <laughs> Once in a while, somebody, somebody I don't know, will say, hello, Danny. And I just say hello and walk on. <laughs> I don't want to find out anything anymore. I want it all to die away and be still. And it will. All except Ruth. Because somewhere behind that black curtain, I was loved and loved someone. We must have known a love that I'll never know again. And so closes The Black Curtain, starring Mr. Cary Grant. Tonight's tale of Suspense. Since the beginnings of history, people have enjoyed wine. Ages ago, our ancestors found that wine made any food taste better. Wine is a simple pleasure that anyone can enjoy. That is why Roma has devoted all its wine-making skills to producing wines of fine quality at a price that means you can enjoy them often, just a few cents a glass. Don't feel that you need fine crystal or a special occasion to serve Roma wine. Next time you have a quick supper... Serve Roma wine in plain tumblers with your spaghetti or cold meat. And notice how much more enjoyment and zest it adds to the meal. Serve Roma wine often, cool or chilled. You'll quickly discover why Roma, R-O-M-A, Roma wines are America's largest selling wine. Yes, Roma wines are true to type. Roma wines are faithful in flavor. Roma wines are sound of character. Roma wines are reasonable in cost. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Our thanks to Cary Grant for his suspenseful performance here tonight. And Mr. Grant wants us to say that he will be listening with you next week at the same hour to Mr. Robert Young in the story called The Night Reveal. Don't forget then, next week, same time, for Robert Young in Suspense. Presented by Roma Wine.